Hey guys, welcome back to Death and All of His Friends. We take a brief detour away from the story of Genesis to add some extra nuance to the idea of sin. Things get really vivid when you encounter the worship system, the worship culture, the worship rituals of Leviticus. So if you'll turn with me, let's read the book of Leviticus. Juke, just kidding. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing, obviously. Although I really think you should at some point. It, it, it is rich and there's a lot of imagery in there. And maybe, maybe this little orientation will help you notice some details that might be significant and help you give some categories to them. You see, what we're dealing with here in the book of Leviticus is the idea of purity. So what will you find in Leviticus? A lot of people have looked at these Levitical laws and this code of conduct and these sacrifices and these grain offerings and, and these rituals to clean things and, and to seek purity and all of these different things. And why? Why are the, some foods clean? Why are some unclean? Are they bad? Are they good? What, what is the, the driving force behind all of this? Why is God giving his people so many different things uh, rituals, habits, practices to remember so that they learn experientially about about what? What is the what is the thing he's trying to communicate? And I think it's really helpful to consult uh, Purity in Danger by Mary Douglas and just read this opening section on her chapter on the topic. Defilement is never an isolated event. It cannot occur except in a systematic ordering of ideas. Hence, any piecemeal interpretation of the pollution rules of another culture is bound to fail. For the only way in which pollution ideas make sense is in reference to a total structure of thought whose keystone, boundaries, margins, and internal lines are held in relation by rituals of separation. She goes on to say in her chapter that the key guiding principle to the whole weird ritualistic world of Leviticus is helping people to see and understand the holiness of God, his otherness, his oneness, his, yeah, holiness. It's a word that means separate. It, it's a word that means complete. It's a word that means in a category of its own. find a bunch of offerings. These are, you know, if, if someone sins or if they want to offer thanks to God, there are all these ways to approach God. And this is, this is key for our study of sin because we realize that over and over again, when sin happens, sacrifice results. We've already alluded to this in other study sessions, but God actually gives them an express and overt way of deciding what to bring to him as a sacrifice. We get this sense that sin is costly. Life will be lost and blood will be shed in a concept we know as atonement. Let me read a little bit from Erdman's. Atonement is reconciliation between estranged parties, bringing them into agreement. The focus is the universal problem of sin, which humankind is unable to solve, and which disrupted the perfect harmony between God and creation, causing separation and death. Atonement, therefore, is God's way of bridging the gap and giving life. From the Hebrew to cover, cancel, purge, purify, decontaminate. And in the Greek, reconciliation. Did you notice this concept that just occurred, this idea of decontamination? You see, that's exactly how Leviticus paints sin as a contagion. So there's all these references to things that defile the land. Let me read this summary verse. There are all these things that defile even the land around the Israelites. This is particularly vivid in chapter 18. There is a bunch of prohibitions against different sexual behaviors, including like incest and bestiality, some weird stuff. And the chapter closes with a warning. So let's read Leviticus chapter 18, 24 through 28. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and laws. The native-born and the aliens living among you must not do any of these detestable things, for all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, 
and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For some story context here, this is referring to the conquest era, right? Remember, God's people were delivered from Egypt uh, by these these plagues, and God, you know, valiantly rescued them and brought them out into the wilderness to reveal Himself. And then that period of wandering that you read about in Numbers and the grumbling, and they weren't allowed to enter the Promised Land yet. And then, upon the generation of Joshua, they entered into the land and drove out the enemies before them. And so. Uh, This was a special covenant for a special time. God wanted to position his people in this strategically uh, important location to be a witness to his character and to his his laws and his love. And so many people, and especially in the West, have claimed those kinds of contours and promises. In America, we have called it manifest destiny, which I think is a very toxic way of viewing these uh, epochs in biblical history and kind of appropriating them for the American story of conquest. So I just, as a disclaimer there, want to nuance properly what we're reading, that this is talking about a specific people at a specific time. But the universals, the principles, the picture, the coloration, in particular in our interest in, in the study of sin, is that there are consequences uh, to our sin that are kind of like pollution. Sin is spoken of here as this environmental hazard, this pollutant, this contagion that is defiling the land, that's making the land sick. And so while we don't think necessarily too often about sin being this Uh, contaminant. I just want to give serious pause to consider what the Leviticus text does to our understanding of sin, of brokenness, of evil, of, of its pollutant aspect, of the reality that when we sin and when we we do things that are are against the fabric of God's design, that it distorts warps and poisons the world around us. Is your concept of sin as big as the Leviticus concept of sin? I think it's worth pausing to consider. How is sin like a pollutant? You know, I believe the good news is all throughout the biblical narrative, even in the book of Leviticus. There are shades of hope. There are shades of reconciliation. There are the means of atonement. And so all of these pollutants of sin are viewed not as a a danger to God, you know, but they have to, you know, become clean and they have to become undefiled and purified and pur- purged and decontaminated before they approached him. Not, not for God's sake, because sin doesn't threaten the existence of God. Sin doesn't threaten his holiness. But his holiness, because he's living in the camp, because he's in this tabernacle that's the, 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 one of the chief elements of the story of the Exodus is that God brought them out of slavery and he had them make a tent. He wanted them to dwell. It is the tent that is coated with the imagery of Eden. This whole idea of God exiling them from Eden. Remember we read about it and he provided a covering for them. God would one day again dwell among his people. And he would have them build a tent. And it would become a temple. And then that temple would become us. But the, the movement of God towards his people actually represents a danger for us. Because of God's holiness... The defilement, the pollution, all of our uncleanness, as it's purified by the holy presence of God, we stand in danger of God's holiness. But here's the thing. The whole book of Leviticus is about the ability to approach God. It is deeply, painfully aware of the pervasiveness of this toxin we call sin. And at every stage, it gives us a way back into his presence. The ancient Israelites knew what sacrifices to bring, they knew what rituals to do, and it signified, it taught them 
that God could be approached, that he wanted to make us pure. And all of this was instructive. All of it was instructive and all of it was pointing towards Jesus. And we no longer need to bring a sacrifice or do a purification ritual before we enter the presence of God. Why? Because God fulfilled it in his own son. He lived the ceremonially pure life. He lived as the atoning sacrifice. That covering of sin, that that decontaminating of sin that we read in the, the Hebrew concept of atonement, all of that took place through Christ. So as we as we close in this reflection on the environmental hazard that is sin, that it defiles, that it distorts, that it warps, that it pollutes the world around us in some spiritual way that we realize that God has entered into this danger zone of sin and and he's taken it away. And Jesus has sequestered the pollution. He has nailed it to the cross. He has put it in the grave. And for those in him, this contaminant shall be no more. That it will be finally and totally dealt with. And so the renewal of the heavens and the renewal of the earth and the renewal of humanity as a result of Christ's sacrifice, this is ultimately what Leviticus points to, that God is atoning for us. He is making it safe to enter his presence as he purifies us in his loving sacrifice. So be encouraged. In the depth of uh, the brokenness and the comprehensive view of sin that we've attempted to interact with here in the scriptures as our view of sin has increased across Genesis and here into Leviticus, that what we see is an equally growing picture of the depth of the love of God.